So I want to talk about uh, the same-sex marriage cases, but I want to put them in a context. And I want to pivot off the title of the conference, which, which I think this topic really fits nicely. How does the Constitution keep up with the times? At what point does the Constitution, at what point do the courts have a role in establishing rights uh, that didn't exist before? And I also want to honor uh, Justice Souter, whom we deeply miss in uh, Washington, who is really the model of a Supreme Court justice in terms of temperament and intellect. And I want to read to you, and you'll be surprised by the, 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 the nominal topic of uh, the decision I want to read to you from. Uh, but in his, one of his very last decisions in 2009, in a dissent in a case, and again, you'll be surprised by the topic, about DNA testing, about whether um, a person convicted of a crime has a constitutional right from prison to get testing of DNA materials that might establish his innocence. Uh, Justice Souter dissents, and I think as I read this dissent in this DNA case, you'll realize that he's talking about something very different. Uh, you'll realize, I think, maybe you'll agree with me, that he's really talking about getting ready for the same-sex marriage cases. Um, and you'll excuse me, I'm going to read at length because it's, it's so nicely done, and it really crystallizes the question of at what point do the courts step in, what's the role of the political branches and democracy in establishing rights or not, and at what point do the courts step in. So he starts by saying, as for deter determining the right moment for a court to decide whether substantive due process, which is to say the Constitution, uh, requires recognition of an individual right unsanctioned by tradition, I certainly agree that the beginning of wisdom is to go slow. Doesn't sound like DNA. Um, and it is just as essential to recognize how much time society needs in order to work through a given issue before it makes sense to ask whether a law or practice on the subject is beyond the pale of reasonable choice and subject to being struck down by judges as violating due process. Changes in societal understanding of the fundamental reasonableness of government actions work out in much the same way that individuals reconsider issues of fundamental belief. We can change our own inherited views just so fast. And a person is not labeled a stick in the mud. That's a nice David Souter phrase. <laughs> just so uh, uh, for refusing to endorse a new moral claim without having some time to work through it intellectually and emotionally. Uh, and then he a a concludes by saying, you have to ask the question of when is a practice beyond the discretion of reasonable political judgment? When is it beyond something that we allow legislatures and people in a democracy to make up their minds about? And when is it time for the courts to step in? So I, I really have little doubt, but this was a kind of valedictory message from uh, Justice Souter, urging people to think about the timing of when to recognize a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Uh, just last week, uh, the number of states that recognized it democratically went up from six to nine, jumped by 50% in a single day. And that may be an argument in favor of letting it play out on the ground. Uh, the Supreme Court on November 30th uh, will decide whether and which of an array of cases it wants to take on this issue and whether it wants to intercede or whether it wants to let the democratic process go forward. There are justices on the court, liberal justices, who think that on occasion the court has moved too fast and has given rise to a kind of backlash. So Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is a hero of uh, gender equality litigation, sort of the Thurgood Marshall of, of, of the gender side, thought that Roe v. Wade moved too fast and gave rise to a backlash in an era where the legislatures were, to her mind, moving in the right direction and maybe actually caused trouble in that area. So the courts have to be very thoughtful about when to move in. Uh, when the Supreme Court finally struck down bans on interracial marriage, only 16 states still prohibited the practice. Uh, at the moment, we have 41 states that prohibit same-sex marriage. Uh, there are two basic flavors of cases that will come before the Supreme Court. One of them I think they will find easier 
and will almost certainly agree to hear, and I will make a prediction about how it will come out. One, they will find much harder, and maybe for that reason, and this would be in keeping with Justice Souter's uh, lovely writing, might decide not to take up just yet, might, to de might decide that the question needs to mature some more. The question that they're very likely to take up is the Defense of Marriage Act. It's a 1996 federal law that did two basic things, only one of which is before the court. One of the things it did, and I'll mention it just so that we can put it to one side, is said that uh, one state does not have to recognize the same sex marriage performed in another state. Think of that as a kind of uh, horizontal rule. That's not what's before the court. What is before the court and what has now been struck down by two federal courts of appeal, one in Boston, one in New York, is Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, which says that for purposes of federal law, only marriages between a man and a woman count. So that people who are lawfully married in the states that allow same-sex marriage get whatever benefits the state decides to give them, but don't get federal benefits. So the federal law discriminates against people lawfully married who are of the same sex, as opposed to people who are lawfully married of different sexes. And that question, um, I think the court will find relatively easy. This is, this is an area where, as in many areas, but more so here than elsewhere, Justice Anthony Kennedy's vote controls. Uh, he has uh, been good on gay rights. He wrote the majority decisions in both Lawrence against Texas, uh, which struck down uh, bans on homosexual sex and uh, Romer against Evans, which was a case uh, that forbade Colorado from withdrawing the ability of gay people to p p participate in the political process. And I think here uh, he will find that states' rights and gay rights are on the same side. That is, marriage is something traditionally thought to be controlled by the states and that it is not asking too much for the federal government, as it generally does, also in this uh, area to provide the same benefits to lawfully married same-sex couples as opposite-sex couples. And since two different circuit courts have struck down a federal law, it's very hard for the Supreme Court not to take the case. Uh, it's also a situation where, and this is unusual, every side of the case wants the court to take the case and decide the case. And the Obama administration finds itself in a funny position where it continues to enforce DOMA but has said it will no longer defend it in court. That's quite unusual. The usual job of the executive branch is to defend federal statutes. Uh, here it's decided that it's unconstitutional, it won't defend it, and that means that uh, they're, they're sort of on both sides of the V, and members of Con me Republican members of the House have intervened in the case in order to defend the statute. So that's one kind of case before the Supreme Court. DOMA, I think they're likely to take it, and I think they're likely to agree with the lower courts that DOMA, that, res that aspect of DOMA is unconstitutional. There's a second case the court will consider whether to hear, and it's a much more ambitious claim. It uh, comes out of the uh, uh, California uh, Proposition 8, uh, litigation. Uh, you may have heard the celebrity lawyers Ted Olson and David Boyes brought this litigation after California voters overrode the California Supreme Court and said California does not want same-sex marriage. So here you don't have a situation where states have same-sex marriage and the federal government is not playing along, but rather a situation and a much, much more ambitious claim and much more in keeping with the question Justice Souter asked of when is it time to say that the Constitution requires same-sex marriage, that there's a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And that's at the core of uh, this Proposition 8 case, uh, uh, Perry against Brown. Uh, I, I, I'm very conflicted about whether the court decides to hear that case also. There would be a logic to doing it. There would be a sort of strategic reason among the justices on the right side of the court to do it, because they may be thinking, listen, society seems to be accelerating in this area. The three states that decided to adopt same-sex marriage, for the first time, all three of them did it at the ballot box. 32 times in a row, when this question was put to, the, put to a vote before actual people, as opposed to courts and legislatures, 32 times in a row, people voted against it. Now, we see a kind of sea change 
where three times in a row on the same day uh, citizens adopted it. And you also see in the polling that there are slight majorities overall in favor of same-sex marriage and huge majorities if you get down into, among younger people. So it does seem that society is digesting this issue and moving forward. And again, then the question is, is it time for the Supreme Court to say the Constitution has something to say about the subject? Uh, I was saying that the right side of the court might think that strategically it's good to take both cases for the following reason. Justice Kennedy is very likely to write the DOMA decision, very likely to strike it down, and he's very likely, as is his habit, to write some grand sweeping language that it's going to be hard for him to get away from the next time the case arrives. If, um, if the court decides to hear both cases simultaneously, and a wrinkle of Supreme Court procedure is that, of course, there are nine of them and it takes five to win, that's easy, it only takes four votes to grant certiorari, to agree to hear a case. So it's possible that the four more conservative justices are going to think, listen, it's our last best shot. We'll take the DOMA cases. We'll take our lumps in the DOMA cases. Can't do anything about that. But maybe if we do the two issues simultaneously, uh, Justice Kennedy will adopt some version of what Justice Souter was saying and say, listen, on DOMA, we're not going to discriminate. If, if there's same-sex marriage already in a state, the feds will go along with that. But if there isn't yet in 41 states, we're not going to establish a constitutional right to it. That's not to say that's a, that's not that's not a that's not a, a a final answer. It still allows states to figure out one by one what they want to do. Um, and I th I think even there, if Kennedy is really made to confront that fundamental question, it's going to be very it's going to be very hard for him. But I, th my point is not so much which direction it should come out in, but rather that there's this sense, and it really goes to the title of the conference, how does the Constitution keep up with the times? It sort of matters what moment in historical time we're at. And if we're at nine states, and when the ban on interracial marriage was struck down when there were 34 states, maybe it's not time yet. Maybe that's how the justices will think about it.